So let me tell you a little bit more about our programs, environmental engineering and geological engineering. They're both housed in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Waterloo. I think you'll be surprised. They're not what most people think they are. So what I'd like to talk with you about today is our programs, what we have both in the classroom and outside of the classroom, because it's much more than just classroom study. We've got a co-op program. We have all sorts of fantastic departmental resources and we're really interested in getting people to where they want to be after graduation. And again, that's a lot more places than you might be thinking of when you hear the words environmental engineering and geological engineering. Then I want to tell you a little bit more about some of our student experiences and then ultimately tell you how to get in touch with us if you have any questions or you just want to learn more about what we're doing. So let's talk about the programs. So in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, we have four programs and I'm going to be speaking with you about two of them. One is environmental engineering and one is geological engineering. So environmental engineering, most people think of it as looking after things in the natural environment, but I like to think of it actually as how people interact with the environment they live in. And so that can actually be both the natural environment and the built environment and the interactions between those spaces and people. So in, in the program, we address issues such as the supply of clean water. Do we have enough? And is it of right quality? How do we treat it to make sure it's safe to drink? And it's not just water, it's also the air and the land that we live on. Is it safe to build on? Is it safe to breathe? What do we need to do with it to make sure that people can interact with the natural environment to the best extent possible for their comfort and their safety? And of course, as you can imagine, climate change, both mitigation of those impacts and adaptation are massive issues that we necessarily have to undertake. Environmental engineers necessarily lead those discussions. And so when you think about engineering, every aspect of engineering needs an environmental engineer. And when it comes to the environment that we interact with, geological engineers are there to help guide us in assessing risks and how we interact with land that we build on and preserve, and also how we interact with resources that are found on that landscape. So for example, subsurface water supplies, and do we have enough? How do we interact with it? Can we preserve it and make sure that it's safe for all water values ranging from ecosystem diversity to drinking water? So let's talk a little bit about the programs that you'll be having inside the classroom as environmental engineers. So you should see here right off the bat, we have a term of coursework and then we go into a term of practical experience in our co-op program. And that pretty much alternates throughout until we get into fourth year. You can see that we've got a lot of required technical courses, but also a wide range of complementary studies electives and tech electives that allow you to choose the paths that you want to specialize in both with respect to your interests and also to uh, the technical areas that you might want to specialize in. One of the things I'd like to point out with respect to our, our program is that you come for the fall term and then immediately in January, you're already getting valuable working experience and getting paid for it. And we've done that on purpose. That's something that allows our environmental and actually our geological engineers as well, as you'll see in a minute, get out into the workspace in January, get that valuable experience and not be competing for jobs in the summertime when most university students are out looking for jobs. And so we see you back in the classroom and it's actually fun to be in the classroom in the summertime because summer courses tend to be a little bit more relaxed and that works really well with making sure that people get the most they can out of their educational experience. So when it comes to then those programs, I mentioned that there are different options for specializing with respect to both your technical program and then moving beyond your technical program. So in the environmental engineering program, we have areas that you can focus on and we, can, we call those specializations. So as you can see here, they have a broad range. It can be energy, alternative energy sources, efficiency with energy, it can be green energy. It can be water supply, and that's what hydrology is. Hydrology is the study of water. We also have uh, individuals here at the university who look at pollution treatment and control, and we're referring to that as pollution here because it can be water pollution, air pollution, and soil pollution. So we're looking at aspects of both when that pollution occurs, how do we clean it up, but also, again, when people interact with society, what can they do to make those interactions more positive, more environmentally friendly? You need environmental engineers to engage in those discussions because they're the ones that specialize in understanding those interactions and what we can do to not only mitigate, but keep 
interacting with our environment in a very sustainable way that means we'll have access to those resources not only now but in the future as well. Our geological engineering program is very similar to the environmental engineering program with respect to its progression. So like the Enviro program, you see that we have alternating terms starting off with a school term in the fall and then going on into co-op in the, the uh, winter term and then coming back to school for the spring term. So again, you're not competing for jobs when there's peak demand. And then what that actually allows you to do is when you go out for your second co-op term, you're gonna be that much more competitive because you're gonna be getting those jobs in your first co-op term that are highly sought after. You can see here again, we have the same pr progression between electives um, that are both complementary studies. So things like policy, things like economics, but then also technical electives that it might allow you to specialize in whatever area of interest you have that goes a little bit deeper than the overview of what is a geological engineer, or what is an environmental engineer. And you can see that progression here. And I should point out that for both programs, fourth year, the terms are back to back. And one of the highlights of that is having a year long, or at least in this case, it's a two thirds of a year long because it's two terms, a design project that spans across those terms that really highlights capacity and interest of our students. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. So hang tight, we'll talk about that some more. In the geological program, we also have several specializations. And so they can range from geology. What are the materials that make up the landscape that we live on? So if you think about Canada, for example, we have a unique geology that even though we say we're very similar to our neighbors to the south in the US, our geology actually means that we have different risks uh, relative to our neighbors. And they have to do with our history of glaciation. So our surficial materials are different when we're building, when we're thinking about water supplies, when we're thinking about hydrogeology, so that's their, the amount and quality of water in the subsurface, and our structures in general are natural infrastructure structures. So our soils are rocks, how, and how we can put built aspects of the environment on that landscape, we need to think about, is it safe? Are there gonna be risks? And are those risks gonna be exacerbated with naturally occurring disturbances that are exacerbated by climate change. So these include fires, floods. So we need to think about how we interact with that environment and sustainably survive in that environment and with our communities and with our interests in including, of course, being able to sustainably live on this planet. Now, we can further enrich our programs because of course we don't work in a vacuum. Uh, in environmental engineering and geological engineering, we necessarily are the department and the programs of, I like math and science. Our science disciplines are our tools and our understanding and math is the language with which we make decisions about science. So we have opportunities to strengthen or enrich our experiences in the undergraduate curriculum, depending on what areas of math and science you're interested in. So we've got some of those listed here for you. Uh, certainly one of the ones that is on the forefront of many people's minds is artificial intelligence. We are now going into an age where machine learning and data-driven analytics are at a new level. We're gonna need to think about how do we, as engineers, as applied scientists, in, make sure that our, the society that we live in really feels comfortable with these technology driven solutions that they feel that they can count on uh, the decisions that are being made not just by people but by computers it's going to be an interesting time and as engineers we take neither a dystopian or nor a utopian attitude about that but rather a science driven perspective and so really we are going to be the leaders of the future helping decide society decide how we make decisions so this is an extremely exciting time to come into civil an environmental engineering department and work in either environmental or geological engineering programs. But it's not just limited to computers and math. We need to have subject matter expertise as well because those programs are only as good as the information that goes into them. So you might be interested in management philosophies and strategies, or you might be interested in the life sciences and connections to health. You might be interested in how do we put together the software that's going to make these decisions? How do we quantify these decisions and risks? Uh, so you might be interested in statistics, for example. 
All of these options are here at the University of Waterloo with world-class experts that you can connect with so that you can be making decisions and making them based on the best available science and math approaches to those decisions. And so this is engineering, it's an involving field and it necessarily means we have to be able to work with others from other disciplines. Now, in terms of our classes, this is, this is an area where you might be a little bit surprised. Yes, the University of Waterloo is a very large university and our faculty of engineering is world-class and it's very large. However, that doesn't mean that students become numbers here. So we have a very targeted and focused strategy with respect to what we expect from students and how we want to interact with them. So in the classroom, as you might expect, there's typically uh, a good number of hours in the classroom. Classroom expectations typically range from about 20 to 25 hours per week, depending on the term and the specific classes you're taking, of course. Um, but the difference between high school and university is a straightforward one. There's in-room class, in classroom learning, and there's also outside of the classroom learning. One of our goals is that you will become lifelong learners. How do we go about that? Well, uh, there's a whole lot of enrichment that occurs outside of the classroom. Um, and that might be in the form of lab time. It might be in the form of non-structured time. Uh, you'll find at the University of Waterloo, there are a lot of study groups and various opportunities to work in that non-structured time. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. But I just want to summarize that overall, as an undergraduate student who's a full-time student, you're pretty much working a full-time job, and that job is 40 to 50 hours a week. So there's the classroom time, there's an equal amount of outside of the classroom time, and really that's true for most university. We do have a, a, a good deal of hands-on time in labs, whether they be design labs or science labs. And then also we have other formats for evaluation, and so I want to talk a little bit about those. So in our programs now specifically, so this is in environmental engineering and geological engineering, I think you'll be surprised to find that you're really not a number. I always think about how amazing it is that I remember students from 15 and 20 years ago, and a big part of that is our philosophy of education. We necessarily keep our classes small. Let me tell you, if you get into our program, it's because we want you and you belong here. Uh, we have small class sizes, they're very competitive, anywhere from 30 to 80 students between the environmental and geological engineering programs. As demand increases, because it's one of the fastest growing sectors in engineering for jobs, we might increase those programs in size a little bit, but we certainly won't increase them a lot. And part of the reason for that is, is we have a commitment to open door policy approaches. We want to interact with the students and get to know them and make sure that they're advancing not only in their academic career, but also in their personal aspirations for their professional development more broadly. So connecting with various aspects of in industry, for example. So consistent with that open door policy is trying to advance your whole growth as a student and as a professional, not just whatever might be occurring in any one class. And so that means getting to know you, and being able to live up to our retention to, once you get in here, we want you to stay here. We wanna help you in whatever it takes, recognizing that it's a big transition from being in high school to being in university. We just talked about how it's a different style of learning, um, but there are also other challenges that you face, and it has to do with learning how to interview for jobs, being able to provide you with feedback on your resume, um, being able to help you advance your interests. So we have, uh, all sorts of supports in place where we can interact with people, but it starts with an open door policy. We have uh, opportunities to explore research, undergraduate research opp opportunities, the URA program. We have um, opportunities to support you in your co-op placements. So connecting with employers, both while you're looking for employment and when you're not. And you'll hear about that some more, but we have wonderfully high placements, almost entire uh, placements every class. And of course, then there's the professional development. So it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you can't communicate that brilliance, then that's not gonna get you very far with respect to development in your career. And also with respect to development and impacting the world you live in and the world around you. So communication is a huge part of what we do. Communicating your ideas, communicating that brilliance, communicating the ideas of groups because multiple heads are better than one with respect to solving the big problems of today, the wicked challenges um, that we are faced with, the wicked problems of things like climate change adaptation. 
So how can we maximize the impact of the science and math that we are learning? That's what it comes down to. And that doesn't stop while you're an undergraduate. Uh, it also then transcends into how you interact in the future. It's, a, it's quite incredible how many of our graduates come back and interact with our students. And part of that is, is because we're all, we're all professionals just at different points in time in our careers. After graduation, there's a range of jobs our students work in, and you might be surprised to find that they're not limited just to engineering. Um, because of the diversity of skills that we develop and topics that we touch upon, our students coming out of the environmental engineering program and the geological engineering program can really take on any number of challenges. And the way I describe it, I think of it as engineering gives you a critical thinking set of skills. And that allows you to take on any careers that you might imagine. So yes, a lot of our students go on and work in engineering, uh, whether it be consulting, green tech, the energy sector, public health, um, even the banking and financial sectors and international development. But you'd also be surprised to find that a lot of our students go into medicine, law, business programs. And that's because our programs give you a good solid basis and critical thinking and communication of that critical thinking. And then what are you ultimately going to do with that? It's going to be to solve problems. So engineering is actually an outstanding basis for pretty much any of these problem solving oriented professions. It's a great way to go. And, Yes, some people stay in engineering, a lot of people go into graduate studies, but a lot of people go into other professional programs. I have a neat slide here, um, which I think shows exactly that. Uh, this is a slide outlining one of our competitions um, that we had uh, for design projects. And uh, I think you've probably heard that at the University of Waterloo, there are a lot of startup companies because why not? If you can have an idea, you can identify a problem, build a solution. There's a lot of need and interest in, in uh, getting those solutions out to impact society. That's what we're all about. This is one of our undergraduate students who graduated in 2014, Tawheed Gafur. So he graduated in 2014, stayed on for a master's degree. He was a graduate of the environmental engineering program. And this year in January, the startup firm that he and colleagues from Waterloo started up, it was called Imagine. And it's all about bringing artificial intelligence into the drinking water sector. They're literally one of the lead companies, if not the lead company globally, with respect to bringing AI approaches to the sector of water supply and water treatment globally. This January, they were bought out by Innovise, so they're no longer Imagine. They're Imagine as part of Innovise. Innovise is a company that recently sold for an excess of $300 million uh, a few years back. So. These are global leaders and uh, Waterloo startup and all within a very short period out of graduating. So we are putting out not only competent technical experts, not only competent people who can go on and work in other professions, but people who are literally going and changing the world. And in this case, in climate change adaptation, water supply. So it's an exciting place to be, both during your time here and after graduation, because these are the people who come back and interact with you um, within the program. And that's where a lot of this experiential learning comes into literally practice and, and also play. So a big part of our program is about combining theory and practice, the mind and the hand, modeling and testing. What can we dream up and then how can we make it happen? And that comes into play in the classroom, but it also comes into play in a lot of design teams. If you can imagine it, it probably exists here. We've got Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Engineers Without Borders is actually where, uh, or it actually originated here in Waterloo. We've got many students involved in teams for Engineers Without Borders. And just because you're an environmental engineer or geological engineer doesn't mean that you can't get involved in other teams like Concrete Canoe. A lot of our students get involved in Concrete Canoe, steel bridge design, um, also the Water Environment and Resources Council Environmental Design Competition. So again, you've got the skills. It's a question of where do you want to apply them and where do you want to expand on your day-to-day -day activities in the classroom. One of the nice things that I can say as a course instructor is also when you have these opportunities to participate, if these opportunities take you beyond campus, if you're involved in competitions, there's always opportunities to integrate that with your coursework so it doesn't interfere. 
Now we do these outside things, but of course we do a lot of these kinds of things inside the classroom as well. There's a couple of examples and images here from our design days program where we literally, even early on in the program, we like to think of our program as designed from day one across our department. And you're starting to be exposed to those concepts really early on whether it be design, design of dams, landfills, we always pick a topic that's relevant and industry experts come in and they provide you with feedback and ideas on how to grow that feedback into capacity. I wanted to show you this figure just because I think it really nicely shows the interaction between our four programs, architectural engineering, civil engineering, and then the two programs we're talking about environmental engineering and geological engineering. Now I'm not going to read this slide to you because you can read it yourself, but the point here is that at the center of all of this is the notion of sustainability. So sustainability is a boundary condition for all engineers. So what we do is the boundary condition for how any engineering discipline is going to look at the interaction between people and the environment they live in. It might be buildings and the built environment from that perspective, which is more architectural engineering. It might be the roads, the bridges that define our communities, and that's more civil engineering. Or it might be the natural landscape, our natural resources, air, land, and water. That's more environmental engineering. And then geological engineering is more about what's on our surface and our subsurface of our land and getting into that specialization. But all of that boundary condition is necessary for humans to interact with the environment we live in. And now more than ever, we're needed because that environment is affected by changing climate. Again, floods, fires, we're interacting with the environment in a different way than we ever have before. And so we need to interact with it sustainably because it needs to be there, not only for us now, but also for generations to come in the future. And so how do we make that happen with respect to de departmental resources and, and the curriculum? We've got industry leaders, we've got academic experts, and all of them bring that experience and expertise to bear inside of the classroom. One of the really neat and special things about the University of Waterloo's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering is that we have a dedicated first year teaching team these are people who have won awards for teaching, and they're not just here to teach you in the classroom. They study learning and teaching styles, problem solving. They're here to help you manage your time to transition from high school to university. We also have specialized TAs who are students who are just a few years ahead of you that will also help you in the classroom with respect to managing your courses and your time because they've been there. They can help you study, they can help you prioritize your deliverables, and they can also help you communicate, not only with each other, but with your instructors and with the administration to make sure that the program is advancing in a way that allows you to put your best foot forward. Because that's what we want. We want everybody to do well, and if that means changing things, communicating and with how we interact, that's what we're committed to doing. It's a team effort here, and it's an open door team effort. So anything that's gonna help make this, the learning experience better, all around. And part of that also then comes from how we interact with each other outside of the classroom. We have a lot of award-winning student societies here. We're really proud of KEGS, which is uh, the Civil, Environmental, Architectural, and Geological Engineering Students Group. They're a perfect example of how we have these different programs and different disciplines, but they all fall under the same umbrella. And they're all charged with the same general mandate, which is sustainable leadership in the built environment and the natural environment and how people interact with both of those environments. So whether they be technical experts or other members of society that aren't in those technical positions. We then bring those people together and those student groups, the faculty get involved in things like, how do I interview? Can, how do I put together a good resume? Can you critique my resume for me? Uh, I'm really interested in this topic and it's not something we covered in class. We have guest lectures that come in to talk about those topics. We have field trips, tours, etc. And of course, we're also very much committed to people's wellness, making sure that you know you're a person first, your health has to come first and foremost. And yes, there's the academic program, but it'll always be here. So let's make sure that you pursue it with putting your best foot forward and making sure that you're in, your, in the best place possible to continue down that academic path now and then also when you leave here. 
One of the things Waterloo is really well known for um, that probably isn't a surprise is co-op. So let's talk a little bit about co-op. We talked a little bit about co-op with respect to advancing through the program and how we pretty much alternate every other term, academic term in the classroom, then experiential term out in co-op. And the progression here of sequence is provided. But one of the things I wanted to point out on this progression is you can see here, we have a really high co-op placement rate. Um, it ranges here on this particular slide anywhere from about 93.7% to pretty much full placement at 99.5%. Um, employers seek out our co-op students because of their capacity. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, the reason probably why our numbers aren't right at 100% is because we have students that also go on uh, their own terms with respect to opportunities, for example, for international study abroad. Um, or they take leaves to pursue uh, a competition, for example. And so they, they step away from a co-op term. Uh, we do have in our program a, a large number of required co-op terms. There are five required co-op terms, um, but you can have a sixth term where you may be on co-op or you may be doing something else. But regardless, as you can see from first year all the way through the final year, we have great placements and we get uh, paid very well as co-op students. Um, you might have heard that students sometimes graduate from Waterloo with um, occasionally no debt, but probably more realistically, a little bit of debt. But as you can see by our, our um, average salaries or earnings for 2019 in engineering, our students tend to do well. So it allows us to um, think about how we want to manage those debts and, and perhaps contribute to our education and the cost of that education. So students do pretty well with co-op. It's a great program. And to boot, you get experiences that will help you decide not only what you do want to do, but equally importantly, what you don't want to do. So when it comes to those real world opportunities, you name it, people have those types of opportunities, private sector, consulting, industry, public sector, government decision making. It could be regulatory government, but it also could be things like municipal government um, or even globally uh, positions with groups such as the United Nations. Really depends on what you're interested in. Some people take research positions um, on campus, off campus. Uh, the positions might be focused on the technology aspects of environmental or geological engineering, um, or they might be focused on the landscape aspects, the natural in infrastructure or environment that we're dealing with. One of the things I like to often talk about is I see it all as infrastructure. Some of it's natural resource based, some of it is built, but it's all infrastructure that we're dealing with. And we're really negotiating how we interact with all of that infrastructure to maximize our goals and maximize benefit for society. Um, but regardless of the types of interactions you have, the good news is that all of those experiences count towards professional designation. So PNG licenses, co-op counts as one year out of four for your professional engineering licensure. There's a whole range of jobs in co-op. I've got some of them listed here and you can read them again, ranging from industry, government, research, um, and one thing I'll point out is that you can also be on campus as a TA. So WEAP is the Waterloo Engineering Endowment Fund. Um, and we have TAs. Those are those TAs I was referring to that help out first, first year students. Those are our second, third, fourth year students that are there to help share their experiences with you. And they're giving back to the program because they want students to excel just like they benefited from other students who helped them excel. So there's a neat range of opportunities that you can have. And not only is that true in environmental engineering, it's also true in geological engineering. Some of them are more discipline specific, but there's also those broader opportunities, environmental, civil consulting firms, the WEF TAs, et cetera. So really neat range of opportunities and you can never capture all of that on a slide. Um, one of the big challenges that people ask us about is first year, what can you do? Um, part-time summer jobs, extracurriculars. We really help you get there um, with, in addition to having those experiences, giving you very specific experiences like surveying, AutoCAD, technical writing in first year, in the first term, so that when you go out for that job, you're competitive. And not only do we do that from a 
classroom side of things, but we also do it from a professional development side of things. So technical writing experience falls in there, but also resume critiques and mock interviews. Those come from both your professors and also a lot of the clubs, the student run clubs we have on campus. And so hopefully, I'd like to think, but I think our students think overall, this leads to some pretty positive student experiences. So with over 250 clubs um, and societies, a lot of faculty, so engineering, faculty of engineering focused events, um, and then university wide events, whether they be intramurals, varsity teams, just clubs, fitness clubs, and also uh, residences that have their own activities. There is a whole lot to do here. And I think if you talk to any UW engineering student, and that really goes for any discipline in engineering, but certainly in the programs we're talking about here, there's time for that. We want you to have time. If there's not time for you to have a life outside of school, that means we're doing something wrong because we're interested in people developing as whole individuals, not just as the narrow technical civil engineer, environmental engineer, architectural engineer, geological engineer. We're a group, it's family style education, open door policy, and we're committed to everybody pro uh, progressing in areas that interest them. And you'll see this in what our students say. This is uh, an excerpt from something that one of our uh, environmental engineers put together about why I love being at, at UW, and her name is Hannah Murphy. She's from the class of 2020. And she talks about exactly these ideas, that we're a family-style tight-knit group. You take most of your courses in, with the same people. Yes, you can take different electives, but for your core technical courses, you're pretty much together with the same group. And what that means is, Little competition, lots of support. One of the things I say to my classes that I teach is I would be thrilled if everybody had above a 90. Um, we want you all to learn and we want you all to succeed and we're committed to doing what it's gonna take to help get you to that point. Um, and that's inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. So there's diverse work opportunities. Hannah said she had three co-ops in government, three in consulting, and one of her uh, consulting positions was actually uh, with a group called Expedition Engineering in, in London, England. Um, so getting a very broad perspective. And she applied that also into her day-to-day -day life outside of the classroom. She got involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, which included eng play and Engineers Without Borders. And so there's really something for everybody, and we want you to come in and be part of this nice, small, tight-knit community. 80 people, and that's at largest, that's not a lot. The people here who are here, we want people who are good and technically, academically, but also who want to have fun, who want to get involved and be leaders and experience life, experience their interests. So go for it. That's who we're looking for. And that kind of philosophy really transcends into how engineers do things. How we do things, there's this idea of engineering design thinking. It starts with empathizing with people. So really understanding what the need of society is so that you can define the problems that need to be solved and then generate ideas um, to solve those ideas, but then be able to focus in and create and create a focused approach because we can we can brainstorm till the cows come home but how are we going to get to those actual solutions and then we go out and test them and then we sometimes have to iterate we have to go through these steps again and so the idea is that this isn't a linear process if you're interested in in problem solving it means you're interested in engineering often especially if you want to problem solve with science the question is how do we make sure we actually have an end product that's going to have an impact for society that's the engineering design thinking process, and that's why engineers can do so many things career-wise outside of the engineering discipline, because it's about problem solving. And so I have a little example here of a problem that I've been really involved in. It's climate change mitigation, and I'd, I'd really describe it as climate change mitigation and adaptation. We've got students ranging from high school through PhD students, so doctoral students involved in projects like this. So the question is, how do we protect our drinking water supplies from climate change exacerbated landscape disturbances. You think about what's happening recently in Australia, wildfires, floods. If you look at what they do to the landscape, they punch well above their weight class uh, with respect to potential detrimental impacts for our water supplies. And so the question is, you know, we can't prevent those. We can try to mitigate those disturbances, but we can't prevent them because climate change is here and it's happening. So how do we mitigate and how do we adapt and what can we do moving forward? And so part of our work has focused on, well, the majority of our water uh, 
across this country, across many parts of the world comes from forests. And if we can have healthy forests, we can have healthy water supplies. And so the question is, how can we look at that forested environment? And what can we do actively, not these passive policies of don't contaminate, but what can we actively do to nurture the landscape, to nurture that natural infrastructure, to make it work as well as possible so that we have healthy water supplies? Um, so it comes from moving back and forth and saying, well, if you're in a place like Alberta, well, in Alberta, that's a wildfire prone landscape. If you're in a place like Halifax, Nova Scotia, well, that's hurricane prone. So the risks to the forest there are going to be blow down as opposed to burning of the landscape. And you say, okay, well, if we know that then, how might that affect water? And how might that affect our ability not only to have a clean water supply, but then what infrastructure do we have in the built environment? How is that change in our water supply going to affect how well our built environment works? And so you can see this iterative process where we're going back and forth and really understanding what's happening on the landscape and what's happening in the built environment to achieve targets of society, which in this case are public health protection, because if you don't have safe drinking water, that's when diseases really start to grow in society. And this is something you might have heard about with Hurricane Maria or other uh, disturbances that have happened on the landscape recently. This is probably something you most recently heard about in Australia. And you might not be surprised now to hear that we've got groups from Waterloo providing guidance, not just across this country, um, but also in other areas like Australia with respect to what do we do um, to make sure that we have resilient, sustainable solutions moving forward. And so the question becomes, how would you design a forest? How would you design treatment plan infrastructure, that green infrastructure and that gray infrastructure to sustainably, sustainably protect drinking water? These are the kinds of challenges that we're taking on. And so if these are the kinds of things you're interested in, uh, developing solutions, solving problems and affecting both the natural and built environment and how people interact with it, you belong in environmental or geological engineering because you will get that expertise and the ability to focus your direction more as to how you can tackle these challenges moving forward. So join us, join us in changing the world. You can find us, our website is here, uwaterloo.ca backslash CEE. Check us out, we'd be very, very happy to follow up with you. We look forward to hearing from you, take care.